This joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sorrow. My love, the crucified, has sprung to life this morrow. At Christ, who once was slain, not first he Death's flood has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. Lover of souls from ill, my passing soul deliver. At Christ who once was slain, not first his three days. My flesh in hope shall rest and for a season slumber till Trump from east to west shall wake the dead in number at Christ who once was slain.
vacation and um, she wanted to trim up my beard and she put on the wrong guard and uh, <laughs> took one swipe and we realized the mistake so everything had to, had to go back down so um, you need, you need are you temper right I, I told her I loved her and our marriage is strong and we're, we're laughing about it right now I mean it, it's just it is what it is it, it happens and every next now and then, time you'll so. go to a professional well I, I do I, I do I, I use I use uh, Kendra Glass she, she's a member it's just trying to get everything done before we left on vacation I was like you know what because we have the stuff at home to trim hair I was like we, we can save some money and we'll just do it that way and you know um, I've gone to a barber in 30 years <laughs> well, you look, you look younger. Yes, I know. I, I have a baby face. I have, I have a baby face. I, I recognize that. And you know, my plan was, if my beard ever turned white and I looked like Santa Claus, I'd be shaving it off anyway. So, um, that Salt plan pepper. might change now. <laughs> now. But, Salt uh, and pepper beards are in, though. Yeah. Um, so. Um, just a, a couple of, of, of things of business, just real fast. Um, next Tuesday, I'll be out of town. I'll be coming back from uh, vacation. So no class next Tuesday. Um, also, and this is much more drastic, uh, the place that watches our kids during the summer uh, forgot to call us when enrollment was open, uh -oh. even though I asked the week before. And so they don't have a place for the summer. So um, right now, we are scrambling, but as of right now, my plan is, unfortunately, uh, when we finish Revelation 22, we're taking a pause until the fall when school starts back up. That will allow me to um, prepare a Bible study really in depth, things like that, but it's just um, trying to juggle all that and kids and trying to figure out what we can do and, and things like that. Right now, it looks like they're gonna be spending a lot of time here in the church <laughs> during the summer. Um, so that's just kind of where things are with that. Um, 
really caught us off guard. Um, found out last Wednesday or Thursday about that. So, just <coughs> great times, great times. <laughs> Um, that happens and my beard gets shaved off. Who knows, right? Uh, uh, so, all right. Uh, that brings us to Revelation chapter 22. First, let's start in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. As we look out in the world, we see the effects of sin. We see the effects of Genesis 3 and all its horribleness everywhere. And it breaks our hearts. And so we long for of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when you the Son and the Holy Spirit will dwell on earth with your people once and for all where you will restore and remake creation where will be sinless and unmarred and all will live in peace and joy once again in Christ's name Amen so last chapter chapter 22 uh, or excuse me chapter 21 dealt Really, for the first time in depth, we got a look of what happens after Christ returns, which is, is somewhat oxymoronic because in eternity there's no after. There's no before an eternity. There's no after an eternity. There's only current. And so when Christ returns, like, yes, these events are happening after, but time doesn't exist. So just to wrap your brain around that. Um, and the, the New Jerusalem, which is uh, 1,300 miles long, 1,300 miles tall, 1,300 miles across, right? This, this, this ginormous city. And we got this picture of this New Jerusalem. Um, it was beautiful. It, it was golden. Uh, th there was 12 gates. Each gate's made out of a single pearl. The gates are always open. Um, the, there's 12 foundations. The, the Apostles, right? Uh, each of the 12 gates has one of the names of the tribes, 12 tribes of Israel is written on it. Um, and one thing I didn't mention then is, is, is that the list that we got earlier in Revelation, which is not the same as the exact 12 tribes. Remember, Joseph was included on that list there in Revelation. Um, but Joseph's not included in the 12 tribes, his two sons are. Right? Um, and we, we talked about that way back dealt with that in Revelation. So here we are. We're at the River of Life. And uh, depending on your Bible, in this chapter you might have, uh, if you have a red letter Bible, there might be words in red letters. And there might not be if you don't have a red letter Bible. So um, this is always kind of the, one of the fun things uh, with, with translators. And um, we'll get to that in, in a second, but it has caused some people some consternation about what exactly is, is happening here. And, We'll explain that it's actually a very easy explanation here. Um, but the sun and moon have passed away, all creation now dwells in endless light. And so uh, let's read chapter 22, and we'll just read the whole section. No, the whole, oh, actually, no, let's read, we'll read one through, we'll read the whole chapter and then we'll break it up. That's what we'll do. We'll read the whole chapter and then we'll break it up. So whoever wants to begin. Then the angel showed me the river, the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am but a, I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God, 
And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer evil still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gate. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Well, there's nothing to talk about. We all know what's going on there. Go mad, go mad, or subtract. Yeah, uh, and we'll we'll get to that in just just a second. So, so remember the the chapters, the verses, um, the headings. Those are all later added to the text. Um, first came. I mean, there there was a, a a verse numbering before our current verse numbering. Uh, that fell out of disuse. I don't know the reasons why exactly on that. Um, until there was verses and chapters, it used to be, uh, and if you read the church fathers, they'll be like, well, somewhere in scripture it said this. Or, you know, Isaiah said this. Well, you know, how many chapters are there in Isaiah? There's, there's over 50 chapters in Isaiah. Right? Um, and, and so a way to look up things, the headings are a very recent um, modern introduction. And... and um, they're nice to find things quickly, but they also shape how you think about, uh, think about a certain section, by the way. Um, so there's, there's good and bad with that. So why I say that is because this, this description of the New Jerusalem is tied with, the, the, the river of life is tied with this, this current. So why we stopped at the end of chapter 21, really in kind of the, the narrative sense, this continues on. Um, at verse 6 is where you have the, uh, the post law, right? Um, and, and so in a lot of times in writing, you know, like we see kind of this, uh, we, we saw this with John's gospel, by the way. You know, these things are written that you may believe, right? Basically, like, we could write a whole bunch, but here's, here's the stuff that you really need to know, right? Um, and, and so... Starting with verse six through through the end of chapter twenty is, is kind of the post law to the rest of the book. So, in this description of Jerusalem, we now see the river of life, and the river of life has been brought forward several times throughout Scripture. Uh, Ezekiel forty seven one, uh, Zechariah fourteen eight, um, even Psalm forty six four alludes to it. Jesus when he is traveling through Samaria and he stops at the well and he asks the woman for water and, and she goes, why do you ask me for water? You know, And he goes, if you knew who was talking to you, you would have asked me for the living water. Right? And he who drinks of it you know, ne never thirsts. So give me this water, sir. Right? So we see the living water all over the place in, in scripture. Um, 
and the living water is in contrast to the other uh, metaphor that water is used for. Water is used for chaos, i.e. evil, a lot of times in scripture. Right? Um, Genesis 1, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And then what happens immediately after that? Creation begins and order immediately starts coming into place. Right? So, or not creation begins, but, but uh, you know, starts separating uh, everything and putting order in, into place. So, um, the living water is in contrast to that. It is pure. It's holy. It's so pure and holy that it's crystal clear. Now, think about that. This is, the, the description that's given is a river. Have you ever seen the bottom of a river? Well, no, because the water's moving. And if the water's moving, guess what else is moving in it? Dirt, all sorts of stuff. But this water is crystal clear. It's pure. It's clean. Um, you can see all the way through it. And so this isn't, this, so this is a different water. It's the water that gives life. And literally, whenever we read water, uh, in scripture, what usually follows is baptism, whether it's prefigured in the Old Testament or explicitly mentioned in, in the New Testament. Well, what is the river of life today? It is the baptismal font, right? Where does this river start here in Revelation? Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And we talked about God and of the Lamb previously, last chapter, this is, this is a, um, uh, a shorthand for the Holy Trinity, that Jesus is God and is fully human. And so there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit on this throne. And you sit there and say, well, is there one chair or three chairs? Well, was there one ark or three arcs? One. There was one, and yet it was the throne of mercy, the seat of mercy, right? Who's, who was there? God. Which person of God? God. Throne is a lot of times used for just the, what what happens there, so it doesn't even necessarily mean that it's going to be a literal throne. Yeah, right. Basically, it's harkening back to um, the, the idea here is 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 going to be if you, if you read this, what you should be imagining is what was at the heart of the temple was the ark, right? Well, there is no temple here, but what's at the heart of it? God. What? was the ark. It was the mercy seat of God in the Old Testament. The temple was that physical barrier to prevent unholy people from getting too close to a holy God and thus being destroyed. And, and also, uh, <laughs> this is, this. you kind of laugh at this because it's also God shielding his vision from seeing all these unholy people, who also knows what all these unholy people are automatically doing all the time anyway. Um, Right, it's kind of like it's kind of like um, Superman's X-ray vision. Right, you're hiding behind a wall, but he can still see you. Um, so, so the, um, even though there's no temple, what's at the heart of this? It's the mercy seat of God, and the reason you don't need the temple is because the people have been made holy. They've been made righteous. Notice, notice this. Uh, just a few verses later, um, next verse. Uh, just the leaves. You know, uh, verse, where was this? Tree of life. Uh, no longer will there be anything or curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. His servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Light will be no more. Uh, they'll need no need of lamp. Uh, Oh, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. The right to the tree of life. There, there is nowhere in scripture that says you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if you are righteous in the sight of God, you have the right to the tree of life. Right? And that, that's kind of kind of blows your mind. But so, so these so there doesn't need to be a temple because the people are holy and righteous. We're holy and righteous when we're there. 
and, but there's still the throne of God, the place where he resides in the midst of the city, and from this throne flows the river of life that flows out of, of the city. And so the question is, is okay, okay where, where's that throne going to be? It's going to be in the middle, so where does the river flow? Well, it flows out in four directions. It's flowing through each in the city. And not only that, you can do we then make the assumption of, well, there's 12 gates, the water's got to get out of the city, so is it flowing out of all 12 of the gates? Yes. Now, what's, what's interesting and, and why, why is this important? Okay, so you notice at the top, I said a new garden, right, in the header, a new garden, okay? Um, and I get into this later in here. You have to go to the next page on verse 22, or 22.2. I have um, a quote from Brighton's uh, uh, commentary here, because he just summed it up. In Genesis 2.8, we are told that God planted a garden in Eden in the east. The Hebrew word for garden was translated into Greek with the word that is the source of the English word paradise. In biblical usage, paradise came to be used as both a reference to the original garden in Eden and also to the heavenly garden of Eden and God's holy presence. The word appears three times in the New Testament in Luke 23, 42-43. That's the thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, Paul speaks of himself in the third person that mentions how he was snatched up to the third heaven, which he identifies as the paradise. And then also in Revelation 2, 7, at the conclusion of the letter to the church at Ephesus, Christ promises the one who conquers that he will give to him to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. While here in 22, 2, only the tree of life is mentioned, it is to be understood that it is in the midst of paradise, the restored garden of Eden. And if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, where uh, God describes, where, where we have Eden described, there are four rivers, that, there's rivers that flow out of it. Four rivers that flow out of it. Eden is on a mountaintop, basically. Right? Where's the new garden? It's on a mountaintop. That makes sense because... Where have we seen God meet his people several times? On a mountaintop. We even saw in Revelation, Christ comes down to Mount Zion, right? Um, so, so this language here, what, why, well, John never says this is the restored garden of Eden. It's very clear that this is the restored or the new garden of Eden. This is paradise. <clears throat> And it kind of makes you wonder, was original Eden 1,360 miles by, you know, I don't know. That's uh, asking a question the text isn't trying to answer. Um, but, but this river of life, um, and, and if you drink the river of life, you are never thirsty. And this is opposed to, this isn't in the notes, but this is opposed to, you think of um, the rich man and Lazarus parable. Or, or story, right? Um, the man thirsts, right? And and if and if just a little finger is dipped in the river and put on his tongue for water, he knows he will never thirst again. But he, but it's too late for that. It's too late for that. Okay. So you drink of the river once and you never thirst again because why? You have life. Why do we need water? Because if you don't drink for three days, guess what's going to happen? You're probably going to, at the very least, you're going to wind up in the ICU. You, you can die. Okay. The, the woman at the well also, uh, she, she was getting water, and then uh, Christ comes, he gives her water, or she gives him water, and then he tells her about water that she would never thirst again. Yep. Same water. Yep. Yep. And and in the same way, and John, John brings this out, by the way, after the feeding of the 5,000, the crowds follow him. Jesus points out, because, because John also, the, the one miracle in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. Um, it's John who records the woman at the well. 
I remember it correctly. If I don't, this isn't going to make sense. But I want to remember it this way, so. <laughs> this is just a little bit off the cuff. John records that. The people follow him. Jesus points out, you're only following me because you got a free meal yesterday. But you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to truly follow me. And that's too hard to say to keep believing. Right? Uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Right? Uh, we, we get that, that, uh, that, that passage is there. That's John 6. Right? Um, and so in John, we get explicitly, the water, you drink it, you're never thirsty. Jesus feeds you, you're never hungry. Right? This is, that's a foreshadowing of this. Right here. Because uh, what's going to happen is, is the tree of life. Let's continue on here. I got a whole bunch of verses. You can just read that on your own here. The tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of, of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything cursed. Right? So, the, so this fruit... Um, what is the fruit? Is it 12 different fruits? Is it 12 different kind of fruit trees or whatever? Again, you're asking questions that aren't necessarily there. Um, is it the fruits of the spirit? I don't, I don't know. I don't know, right? Is it kind of like a physical representation for that? Now, interestingly enough, right, he uses this, and I want, I want to pause here, right here, yielding its fruit each month. But there's no sun and moon. Go back to Genesis. What's the sun and moon given for? The keeping of days, times, seasons. In other words, the keeping of months. Right? So what John isn't trying to say here that there's months in eternity, what he's trying to say here is, is so that we can understand this, is that the trees are forever bearing fruit. Right? There's no, okay, it's spring, it's summer, right, it's fall, now they have fruit, okay, everybody store up because you got to last this for the rest of the year, right? Because the other thing is, and this, this is very important, you'll see modern, sometimes modern commentators will sit there and they'll read this, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Oh, there's 12 months in a year? Every month we get new fruit. Well, in John's calendar, there were 12 months. The modern Gregorian calendar hadn't been invented yet. Right? And not only that, the Jewish calendar doesn't have 12 months. So whatever calendar, if you want to take the Roman calendar of that time, if you want to take the, the Jewish calendar of that time, they don't have 12 months. And, and, and this is why, by the way, we have December as the 12th month, even though Desi means 10. And November is the 11th month, even though the Nova, Novi means 9. Oct means 8. Sept means 7, right? Because in the Gregorian calendar, they inserted July and August for Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, right? Uh, so, uh, basically, the, the, the tree of life is ever producing its fruit. In other words, this, this is the place of immortality, right? Why were Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden? So they want to be confirmed in eternity for their sin, so that they want to eat of the tree of life and thus miss out on the forgiveness of God. Well, that just makes sense. I mean, yeah. the, the eternity, and we even hear in Scripture how, how the, the sin has affected even even the defiance and yep. everything else. So, yep. so we get to eternity, yep. and it's like the garden. We don't know how, how often the fruit you know, matures yep. in the garden. We just don't know. Yep. Yeah. Um, ab ab absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and again, we, we get this, this, uh, this reminder, there's nothing accursed, right? Well, what does that mean? Okay, well, what was part of the curse? You guys remember the, the aspects of the curse? Uh, there's going to be thorns, right? Um, by the sweat of your brow will you bring forth the fruit of the earth, right? We don't ha you don't have to work for this, and there's nothing preventing you from eating this fruit. You're not going to pick your 
uh, prick your hand on a thorn. I don't know if you guys, I, I have those, um, what are they called, black locust trees or whatever in my backyard. They're native to Oklahoma, and uh, right now they have pretty white flowers. Some people make, uh, you can make jelly out of those flowers, by the way. Um, it's supposed to be really sweet, kind of a, uh, anyway. And you get thorns on them. I mean, like, you got to be careful. And, and they tend to thorn if you trim them and cut them. So you go and you trim up the tree, and the next year they have thorns. Um, one died in in, uh, or, uh, in my at my brother and sister in law's house. My brother in law and his sister in law's house. They had one removed. They still find thorns to this day in the ground. I mean, you don't want to step on it. Uh, so there's there's no thorns in the trees. There's nothing preventing you from eating this fruit. You don't have to work for it. The trees are naturally fruiting all the time. And you think, well, what do you mean you don't have to work for it? I don't care if, if you have a, a, you can have a fruit tree in your yard. But if you don't water it right, if you don't fertilize it right, if you don't keep the pests away right, how much fruit are you getting from that tree? Not a lot. And, and if you go to the store and you buy an apple, an apple's huge, right? You get one off the apple tree in your yard, my, my, my in-laws, um, um, it's also that they have a couple apple trees in their backyard. And those apples get about that big. They're well taken care of, but nowhere as big as what you buy in the store, right? And it's because farmers have to put in a lot of work. So, so again, this, this fruit is free for the taking because there's no longer sin in the world, right? And there can't be sin in the world because the throne of God and of the Lamb is in it, and his servants will worship him. And then this amazing thing, they will see his face. Why is that important? Because if you and I were to see the face of God right now, we're done. Right? The last thing people are going to see is the puff of smoke. Okay? Um, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, didn't even see the face of God. He just basically saw up to the knees, maybe even just the mid-calves. Woe is me. Right? I'm done for. Okay. Um, so, so the face of God, we'll, we will see the face of God. In other words, we will be made perfectly holy to where we can be in the presence of God and not fear his wrath for viewing his face. And his name will be on our foreheads. And this is in contrast to the, uh, the, the sign of the beast, which is on the forehead and on the mind. So, does this mean you're going to have a tattoo like Yahweh or God on your head? No. It, your mind will be perpetually turned towards God. Right? Where is our mind perpetually turned to right now? Outside of the Holy Spirit working in us, it's turned to us. It's turned to sin. Sure. Right? But since there's no longer sin, our mind is perpetually turned to God. This doesn't mean you're a mindless uh, robot into the collective board. You've lost all individuality. It just means we are rightly oriented towards God. Uh, and night will be no more. Why will there... Uh, night will not be any more because, again, uh, light symbolizes good, darkness symbolizes bad in Scripture. So there's no night. Um, so we're not going to need a lamp or the rising sun. Uh, the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And if you read the Lord God in the New Testament... Um, that is the same as uh, God Almighty in the Old Testament. Um, Lord uh, is, is um, so by the time of the writing of, of the New Testament, so after the Babylonian captivity, they stopped using the, the word, the, the name of God. And they started using Adonai. That's how we get the word Jehovah, because they took the consonants for the name of God, the tetragram, uh, Yahweh. And they added the vowel sounds for uh, Adonai, which means Lord in, in Hebrew. And because of how their language works, some of the sounds changes, and you get Jehovah or Jehovah from that, which is a made-up word. So when John says the Lord God, what he means here is um, God Almighty, as he, um, um, Yahweh, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Okay, this, this is substitute for the name of the Lord, the name of God. So any questions on those five verses? 
Who's looking forward to that? Yeah. Sounds like paradise, pun intended. <coughs> okay, so now we get to the epilogue or the postlogue, um, but, but the epilogue, uh, the remaining uh, 6 through 21. And so we get this last word of encouragement to the church. So this angel, right? Who is this angel? This angel appeared back in verse 21, 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues um, spoke to me saying, right? And then at the beginning of this chapter, then the angel showed me, okay? And then he said to me, so this is who is speaking. Then he said to me, now this is important, and this is going to set everything else up in our understanding. What does angel mean? Messenger, right? Messenger, okay. These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must uh, soon take place. Okay, which words? Everything from Revelation 21.1, or excuse me, 1.1 to 22.5. Um, and and uh, the same spirit that spoke through the prophets, which is the spirit of the Lord, has now revealed this vision to John, this revelation, or the Greek word apocalypse, to John, um, so that he can tell it to the servants. In other words, Christians. So even though that they're about to and are being persecuted, they know even in the midst of this, Christ rules. Jesus is Lord. Okay? The church had a political statement. The early church did. It was that Jesus was Lord. Um, at some point in history that became Christ is King. I don't know how or why. But Jesus is Lord, what they proclaim. Christ is an office, therefore absolutely Christ is King. Jesus is a person who was God. And so to say Jesus is Lord is to say Jesus is God, but it's also a political statement. You're saying that Caesar isn't Lord or God, and that's why some of them were killed um, and, and persecuted. So uh, God sent his angel to, uh, to show John, and this here is the message of Revelation. Um, Oh, this is a this is this is supposed to be in quotes. This is a quote. Um, so just all this. The definite article before this angel seems to identify him. Uh, okay, uh, got all that. And one one we're told that Jesus Christ through his angel gave the message of revelation to John. Okay, so this is important. So um, since we have that clue, this is why this angel and the angel from one one are probably the same angel, same message. Um, so only a reference in Revelation to an angel as the angel of Yahweh, the God, in 22.6. Okay. He says, and the Lord, God of the spirits, and the prophets. So uh, where this angel came from? I'm just trying to run through this right here. Um, so yeah, that's just all this. This is what's important, that, the, that the, the revelation came through the angel, came through the messenger. Uh, Jesus gave it through his angel. And why is that important? Well, who gives messages through the angels? God. God. So what is John reminding the hearer of once again? It has reminded, hammered home this point throughout Revelation. Jesus is God. God. Okay? Um, this, not Jesus is the first created, not Jesus became God, but Jesus is the God. Um, so, what, even though we, we are very, very careful to not take doctrine from Revelation and then apply it to the rest of Scripture, Revelation is one of those books that very much buttresses that Jesus is God. Um, 
So, so this angel says, these, are the wor these words are trustworthy and true, the Lord God. And then, if you have a red letter Bible, you notice that verse 7 is red. So, so what is going on here? Is this angel Jesus? No. No. In the same way, and this is why I wish it was more consistent in red letter Bibles. They don't do this in the Old Testament, but they should. In the same way that we will have multiple passages in the Old Testament. Go to the people and say this. So I went to the people, and then what do you see? You could have copy-pasted what the prophet said because God, right? So those words should be in red because it's God who is speaking. Um, so the angel is quoting Jesus. The angel is not claiming that he is coming soon, but he is relaying the message to the apostle, John, that Jesus is coming soon. And in the same way that we see in the Old Testament that God will speak in the first person and then the prophet will speak in the first person, we see Jesus speaks in the first person, and so the angel delivers the message in the first person, and so John, who is apostle is, one of the roles of apostle is prophet, one who speaks on behalf of God, because they receive messages from God. John gives the message in the first person. So, this is not, this is not, this is not the angel suddenly being Jesus and we've been tricked all along or hoodwinked all along or anything like that. But this is literally um, the angel relaying the message that he was told to speak and then John relaying that message that he was told to write down. Well, I think that, and that's why God has, you know, the next, the next verse, verse 8, you know, he starts to worship this angel, and this yes. angel says, no. Right, exactly, because yeah. then you get into verse 8 here. Okay, well, first off, I'm going to pause right here before I get to verse 8. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. Okay? And then um, uh, then also in verse 18, I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the word, the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. Remember, prophecy is a message from God. It's not a foretelling of the future necessarily. It, it, a lot of times prophecy does involve that, but prophecy is a message from God given directly. So, how do we understand those words? Well, when John wrote those words, guess what they applied to? The Revelation. The Revelation, the, what we now call the Book of Revelation or the Apocalypse of St. John. Now, in our understanding of Scripture, Scripture is the um, inerrant Word of God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It is written in the hands of men. It was written in the Old Testament. It was written in Hebrew and uh, Aramaic. In the New Testament, it is primarily written in Koine Greek. There is a few phrases of Aramaic in there. Um, uh, I don't think there's any Latin phrases, even though Latin is said, you know, the, he's the king of the Jews, right? He's, um, so it's written in three languages. Um, it's been, of course, translated into multiple languages at this point. There's multiple English <coughs> translations. Um, We understand these words to not just apply to the book of Revelation, but to apply to all of Scripture. Now, why? Well, because all of Scripture is God's word. And if I were to add to or take away God's word, I'd be in violation of the first, second, and third commandment. Does that mean misinterpreting Scripture or teaching, uh, like, like we're teaching, you know, the... Uh, the thousand year reign. We yeah. already discussed that that's, that's, so, that's, so, that's, a, that's not yeah. a correct teaching. Yeah. Um, or figurative. I understand, but, but it's, it's, it's. I'm not going to place myself in the seat of God. Okay. <laughs> right. But, right? 
Um, we would we would understand that, the, and this is why we have those disagreements with them. But we still say that they're still Christian because they still hold to 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 Christ through the Trinity. And here, here's here's the other important thing. All right. If there was no Bible, would there still be Christians? Yes. Because the Word of God isn't just dependent upon it being written and printed. Okay? Um, the Word of God, starting from Adam until Moses, was passed down orally. Isaiah prophesied. He spoke, and then those prophecies were written down. He could have had more prophecies. We don't know that. We know from reading the Old Testament, there are a number of prophets that we don't have their prophecies. Right? Well, and you just gave the example that wasn't it John that said, these things are written. That you may that believe. That you may believe. Right? Exactly. It doesn't say that this is all of everything. Right. This is just these e things exactly, that were written. Exactly. So, um, so uh, this was, I mean, this is our argument against um, the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church in the 1500s that we still maintain to today. Yeah, you have added things, and they are wrong. Um, and, and so you should remove them. Right? Um, so I'm not going to condemn Christians. That's, that's not my place. What, I, what I'm saying, though, is that, is that we understand that these words apply to all of Scripture. And what is Scripture? Scripture is the word God. Okay? And in the Lutheran confessions, which we subscribe to, we do not list the number of books. Unlike the Catholics, who have a set canon, the Eastern <coughs> Orthodox, who have a set canon, and there's different variances among the Eastern Orthodoxes, or Orthodoxy, the Lutherans, we just call it scripture. Okay? Now we recognize that the Apocrypha is a uh, uh, Deuterocanonical, so it's not the inspired word of God. All right? But Lutherans can still preach and teach on the Apocrypha because it teaches the truths of the Scripture. That makes sense. Okay? And so people might say that we're very squishy on this, but it's because we can find nowhere in Scripture that says, well, these are the books, and those aren't the books. And so we're gonna be very, very careful to only go as far as God goes. And so if there's an open-ended question, we're gonna leave it an open-ended question. Some people don't like that. And so then you ask, well, why does the Lutheran Study Bible then only have 66 books? And you go back to the American Bible Society, and they decided to cut some a cost, and so they left off when they were printing the King James Version, they left out the apocryphal books. And that became popular in America. And most English translations today, because believe it or not, America is the largest English-speaking market in the world, write and publish towards an English-speaking audience, which is why you have the NIV, right? And then you have the NIV Anglicanized version. And if I go to Mardell's, or if I go to Hobby Lobby, or if I go to Barnes & Noble, and I pick up the NIV off the bookshelf, it's not gonna be the Anglicanized version. It's not going to be the British English. U's aren't gonna be suddenly added to O's in random words, and they're not gonna, you know, color's gonna be spelled correctly, okay, all right? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we, we have, technically, we have an open canon in, in the Lutheran Church. Um, and some people don't like that. Fair enough. We can't go beyond what God has told us, and God has not answered the question. Now, when I say well, I have an open canon, we believe the canon is closed. And what I mean by that is, is we do not believe that there has been a word from God since Revelation that applies to the whole church. Right? And that, that's important. Um, so we believe the canon is closed, but we don't number the books of the canon. Why? Why do we believe the canon is closed? We have not found, when I say this, we, we are open to the possibility 
that there could be a revelation that applies to the whole Christian church. <coughs> but since the book of Revelation, we have not seen that happen. And so that's why we would say we believe the canon is closed. We still leave, we leave that possibility open. You know, we crack the door. Um, but uh, Book of Mormon, no. The Quran, no. The Watchtower, no. What? The Book of Tongues. The Gospel, yeah, the, the, the Gnostic Gospel. Okay, right out. Okay, um, so uh, and and what we would do is is if somebody claimed that they had the, the book of Aquarius, which was a uh, from the 1970s, right? If somebody claimed that they have a revelation from God, we do the same thing as the Bereans, and we say, okay, let's look at it. Let's look at it where it compares with Scripture, and if it's in conflict with the so far received canon. And that's important, the received canon, not the canon that we have made up, but the canon that we have received from God, then we reject it. And for 1900 years, oddly, um, we have found that every other revelation is in conflict with Scripture. And it's not just us, I mean, this is just Orthodox Christianity. That is why. Um, so the angel quotes Jesus, um, and, and so uh, we, we have this. Um, and so then John, John falls down to worship this angelic being, this heavenly being, I should say, right? And this is how we know that this is not Jesus, explicitly in the text. I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me, also to show that John is not perfect, right? Peter has his moments of failure. John's about to worship something that's not God, okay? But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. All right? So this angel is not God. It is a heavenly being. A divine messenger, um, but not Jesus. And this is an important distinction, and this is why I brought back up the Old Testament thing, because Arianism, which is alive and well today, so Arianism was that Jesus is not God, but he's the first created. Okay? Now that's Arianism. It's alive and well today, Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness, um, if they know what they're talking about, will freely admit that they are Arian. Arianism was condemned in the 300s, 325? Something like that, AD. Um, it's why we have the Nicene Creed, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, uh, begotten but not made, being of one essence with the Father. Um, right? right? That language is explicitly in there to contrast the, he the heretical teaching of the Arians. Um, so they will go to this, and they'll say, hey, look, that's red letters right there. That's Jesus speaking. And John falls down, and, and the, the angel says, no, worship God. So Jesus isn't God. Well, no, that's not what's happening in this, this context. This is an angel who is relaying a message from God, just like we saw in the Old Testament all the time. All right? Um, and then, uh, and he said to me, do you not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Well, what time? The return. The return, right? Right? And then, um, then the verse 11, let the evil doers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still be right, and the holy still be holy. Okay? Um, does this mean that we're not supposed to call people to repentance? No. What it means is, listen, you guys let the chips fall where they may. God's going to sort it out at the end. He's God. You don't worry about those things. You still do what is right. And if somebody's not going to do what is right, you can correct them, uh, reprove them. If, if it's a brother, reprove them uh, in, a, in a brotherly fashion. You know, you still witness to what is right to the world. That is part of being what is right and what is holy. But as far as, as judging people, listen, Leave that to God. 
your job, your one job, worship God. That's what you do. Okay? Um, and then we have a quote again from Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. Okay. All right. So for the unrighteous, that means they will be paid the unrighteous wage. We don't want that wage. <laughs> for the righteous who are covered in the blood of the Lamb, that means you'll be paid what the righteous are paid. Eternity with God. Okay? And then, this great statement that we've seen twice before, and both times have been God the Father speaking. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus is God. In case you missed that all before, Jesus is God. He's the one who created creation. He is the one who ends creation. Um, there's no. Uh, I like I like your quote in or about 2012 what you've written that. It's God's timing, not our timing. Yeah. Because soon means to me, soon in, within the time frame is going to mean something different than necessarily what God means. Yeah. Right. God's timing is not our timing, so soon could be tomorrow. They, uh, my daughter was convinced Jesus was going to return this Easter. Right. And she's convinced that whenever he returns, it will be an Easter. I asked her, well, why is that? Because he rose from the dead on Easter. I was like, that's really good logic, <laughs> actually. I like that thought, yeah. Um, so. But it may not be. It may not be, but I think it's a cool idea, right? It makes all the sense in the world. Well, we yeah. may not have it right either, and we may be celebrating Easter when it's not. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, there's, there's a question of, so, because um, it follows the lunar calendar, and I can't remember... There's a lot of things in theology, okay? So when I say I can't remember, it's just because, like, either I looked it up and I literally can't remember, or I just I don't know because it's just not a thing of interest. But um, sometime, I believe in the Middle Ages, the, the medieval time, I think it was the Jewish calendar that got shifted. And um, the Orthodox churches followed that shift which is why um, the Western Rite Churches, the Western Churches, the Latin Rite Churches, which we come out of, why we hold Easter on a different day than the Orthodox. Um, because there still corresponds to Jewish Passover. Whereas there's that. So, again, I don't know who shifted what, when or where, <coughs> or why. Honestly, to me, it's not that big of a thing. Every Sunday is an Easter. He rose on the first day of the week. Okay? So you can make the argument that he's going to rise on Sunday. We'll see. But uh, that's God's prerogative, not my prerogative. Um, so, uh, beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. And so this this is John here. Uh, with this With this... Vision. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Well, again, who, who are the ones that wash their robes? They are Christians that have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And so come out in dazzling, uh, brilliant, white, whiter than what you could bleach them. Okay? In other words, these are the people covered in the righteousness of Christ. How do we cover in the righteousness of Christ? By faith, by baptism. Right? Um, those, those things. Um, and so because they are covered in the righteousness of Christ, they have a right to the tree of life. They can enter into the city gates. Um, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Does that mean they're outside the city gates? No, it means they can't get into the city. Where are they? We already know where they are. They're in the lake of burning fire. 
But why the dog? Does this mean my dog goes to hell? No. Right? But you've almost always said that our cats go to hell. <laughs> cats are Satan, yeah. There's a, there's a joke. Uh, you know, for everything, I disagree with Rob Bell. He did have a very funny, funny joke. Um, and he was talking about um, Adam naming everything. And, and he starts out, you know, Adam's coming up with these weird names. He's like, elephant. And the angel's like, well, how do you spell that? The other angel's like, I don't know, write it down, you know? Oh, you know, go to giraffe. Then you get to the end, you know, right? And it's like, okay, what about this one? He's like, dog. God's like, that, my name's spelled backwards, right? <laughs> He's like, oh, wait, there's one more. And, and Adam's like, oh, that's cat. And God's like, wait, I didn't make that. <laughs> anyway, um, that's my joke. It's partly because I'm allergic to cats. Uh, I love cats, they're fine. They're just not for me. Um, anyway. All of that to say, um, this, it, that, that's a, uh, a euphemism, a symbol for, for um, that, and, and we see this in the Old Testament again, and what imagery does Revelation heavily rely on? Old Testament imagery, okay? If somebody's body was thrown outside the city gates, that's where the dogs would feast on them. In other words, that person is cursed, okay? So the dogs aren't in hell. He's saying that they're out in the cursed place. Okay, that, that, that these people that practice these things are out in the cursed place. Martin Luther, um, by the way, famously wrote, uh, uh, I think when he was in Wartburg Castle, um, do not fear, little pup, um, your golden tail for... Um, shall arise on the last day, or something like that. Basically, you know, Martin Luther loved dogs. Um, and, and that he believed that God would resurrect our pets as well, all created. I'm not sure we're so. Yeah. I don't want to go down that road because we're asking questions that aren't in scripture. <laughs> I just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when we get up there, we can bring it up with God. Be like, if you're taking any advice. <laughs> Okay. Um, but since he's not recommending you take it up with God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, it's not a matter. Yeah. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Okay. So, uh, again, we have Old Testament imagery here. Uh, Jesus has sent the angel to testify, to, to, to be the witness, the martyria about these things for the churches. What churches? The seven churches that the letter is addressed to, a.k.a. the whole Christian church. Um, I am the root, the descendant of David, right? Um, so if, if he's the root and the descendant, again, this, this, uh, this uh, the Old Testament imagery um, from the stump of Jesse, right? Um, Oh, no, no, okay. Um, uh, you know, my, uh, David said, um, you know, it's my Lord. Uh, you know, the, the quotes there, Jesus is the source of David, and he also comes from David. He's a source of David in respect to his divinity. He is the descendant of David in respect to his humanity. And these things are not mutually exclusive, but this is the hypostatic union, the combination of God and man. Um, the bright morning star. Now, there's one that you said, they go, hey, wait. The morning star in the Old Testament um, has been used to refer to Satan, actually. Mm -hmm. Jesus saying that he's Satan. Now, remember, what does Satan claim? What does Satan want? He wants the office of Christ. Okay? And the morning star is the star that brings light, that brings the day. It is um, depending on how you want to translate it, it's either Venus, which heralds the rising of the sun, or it's the sun itself. Okay. Um, Jesus is saying here, I hold rightly the office of the Christ. That, that, so I am God, and I am the Christ. I am the judge, and I am the mediator. Nobody else, and nobody else takes that office from me. Um, 
the Spirit and the Bride say, come. Okay, who's the Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Who's the Bride? The church. Okay, what are we say why are we saying come? We're saying, Jesus, come again. And let the one who hears say, come. So he who hears this message say, Jesus, come. Right? And uh, let the one who is thirsty come, and the one who desires to take the water of life without price. In other words, uh, those who thirst for righteousness, um, the, you know, the thirst shall be slapped. Okay? We're, we're bringing in this river of life imagery again. And do you have to pay for it? No, Christ paid the price. He paid the price on the cross. And then this, this kind of final warning here, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described. So basically, hey, don't add anything to this prophecy. Don't take away anything to this prophecy. If you add stuff to this prophecy, you're going to be adding law. You're going to be speaking where God doesn't speak. And if you take away, you're going to be taking away God's word as well. And therefore, you're going to it ultimately will be taking away the gospel. And you can sit there and say, well, what if I take away the parts that are condemnation? What if I take away the parts that are law? If you take away the parts that are law, you take away the gospel. Because if you take away that which accuses you and kills you, then you take away that which gives you life and frees you. And this is the issue with antinomianism. Antinomianism um, takes away God's law, says it doesn't apply to Christians anymore. Right? Um, and, and that since Christ has, and, and to be an extreme antinomianist, since Christ has come, there is no law that applies to anybody, and this is how you get universalism. Universalism is just the great antinomian heresy. Right? Um, but if you take away the law, you take away the gospel. Well, that's, that's why in the Lutheran Church we preach law and gospel. Yep. So that you see your sins and you, and you trust Christ to forgive yep. you. Um, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. So who testifies to these things? It's not John. It's not the angel. It's Jesus. Testify, the Greek word testify, uh, martyri, uh, comes from the Greek word martyria. Uh, we get the word martyr from it. One who gives testimony. Okay, witness. All right. Um, so who testifies that these words are true? Jesus, this is the word of God. Okay. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. What does amen mean? Yes, yes. Let it be so. Christ, come. May the grace of Christ be with us all. Yes, yes. Let it be so. And we're done. That's Revelation. I don't know when we started. I had a beard then. Uh, so we're going to be on break until the fall currently right now, um, unless situations change. So um, just the way it is. So, so enjoy your summer break. Um, if you'd like to take up anything in the fall, let me know because I got a few months to research and write and do all that fun stuff. Um, otherwise, if you leave it up to me, I'll just uh, I gotta, I'll make a dartboard and throw a dart and whatever it lands on. What we'll do.